This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Hi, I'm Nick Ravellis, the Geisel Director of Education and Outreach for San Diego Opera. As you know, we have a number of opportunities for you to get to know opera and our current season by tuning in here to UCSD TV. One of our most exciting offerings is Stars in the Salon. This series is an opportunity for you, our audience, to meet the singers, the conductors, and the stage directors who create our productions. Taped before a live audience, the artists discuss their roles, the music, and the stories behind the operas. It's especially entertaining and informative for those of you who are new to opera. Join us now for Stars in the Salon, and I'll see you at the opera. Welcome to this Stars in the Salon, this Artists' Roundtable, concerning our first production of the international season, 2012. We've made it thus far and we're still going strong. We're, we're, we're really delighted to have you all here. Uh, it shows an intense interest in this wonderful opera that we haven't seen actually uh, uh, here at San Diego Opera since 1998. Some of you may remember that production. It was actually the first season that I started full time with San Diego Opera. Um, uh, and uh, I remember it fondly and I've been waiting for it ever since. Now we'll have to get on to Electra. Don't you agree? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll do it. So, uh, first of all, I would like to introduce the artists that uh, have joined me. Oh, and before I do that, I want to um, announce that um, this season, The Stars in the Salon, is sponsored by a generous grant from Holland America Line. Let's thank you for Holland you. America thank you. Thank you. for that. And uh, without their support, this would really not be possible. And without your support, so many things that we do in terms of outreach wouldn't be possible. So thank you. Thank you all who give money, who donate time, treasure, and interest to this great art form. So um, I'm going to skip over Ms. Lindstrom for the moment. Uh, she's on her way. Um, and um, uh, uh, next to her on the table um, was with us last production of Benjamin Britten's Peter Grimes as the conductor of that production, Stuart Bedford. <laughs> Next to him, our stage director making his San Diego Opera debut, Sean Curran. <laughs> Next to him, uh, Heldon Tenor, who has not been with us since Boris Gudunov, and that's got to be six or seven seasons ago, uh, tenor Alan Glassman as Herod. <laughs> and finally, uh, over there on the end, bass baritone singing the role of Yokanaan, Greer Grimsley. <laughs> All right, now I'd like to start out a little unusually, some of you are familiar with the quote by this critic uh, concerning Puccini's Tosca. He called Tosca a shabby little shocker. And I thought, well, if he called Tosca a shabby little shocker, <laughs> I wonder what he has to say about Strauss's Salome. This is a little lengthy, but not too, I think you'll find this fun. <laughs> Zalome, Yokanaan, Herod, and Herodias are as, are as unreal as the less laboriously etched figures in Turandot. For only some kind of sympathy or interest on the part of the composer could make them live. This was not forthcoming. And so the sensational action is, in the deepest sense, irrelevant. <laughs> Strauss probably intended the piece as an abstract display of sexual perversion, and as such, it has been admired by some critics, obviously not him. <laughs> but I find no reality on this plane either. Consistency, power, unity, ingenuity, yes. 
The overloading of detail is not as tedious as in other Strauss operas, and the whole is bound together with the greatest skill in a form comparable to that of a symphonic poem. The musical progress comes to its triumphant conclusion on the very last page in a very famous, very loud passage, which carries harmonic audacity farther than ever before. <laughs> in musical technique, masterly. In sentiment, the most banal sound in the whole opera. John the Baptist's severed head might as well be made of marzipan. <laughs> and here's the kicker. And it is for this sugary orgasm that all the fantastically involved aphrodisiac machinery has been required. <laughs> That's oh Joseph Kerman in the book Opera as Drama, which you have to understand was published in 1952. I wonder if he would have changed his mind by this point. But I would just ask for some reactions from our panel <laughs> to the comments of Mr. Kerman, and then we'll move on. But I thought it might be a sort of interesting gateway into uh, our discussion. Anyone? Well, a load of rubbish. <laughs> Absolute rubbish. Oh, sorry. I'll, I'll say that again. Say it again. I yeah. would consider that to be a good, really good road of rubbish. Uh, just take one point at random, which you could take any you like. Opera as reality, what are we talking about? Um, how can you criticize an opera because the people don't appear to be real? There are hundreds of wonderful operas where the people can't really be considered to be real, particularly from the Baroque period, like Handel, for instance. No, he was just making a, a case for, he was just being sort of Prov provocative, I suppose, is the word, really. He actually came to England as professor of music at Oxford University, but I don't think he stayed very long. <laughs> <laughs> um, our, uh, our Zalome, I see, has just Yay. arrived. Please Yay. come up. <laughs> oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> they, they separated us on purpose. <laughs> And this is our Salome, Lisa Lindstrom. <laughs> so you're excused from the first question, but I'd still like to get more reactions from what Mr. Kerman had to say. Yeah, I hadn't read that. So, Isn't that uh, awful? It's awful. <laughs> and, you know, more than sex, the opera for me is about longing and obsession and regret and jealousy, but very human emotions. Um, when I got the assignment to direct the opera a few years ago, the, the first time, I was reading another book called The Rest is Noise, oh, yes. which is a brilliant book by Alex Ross, who's the music critic, critic for The New Yorker. And uh, the little epigram of the subtitle is Listening to the 20th Century. And it starts off in 1905 with the premiere of Salome. So it was an odd bit of synchronicity to get the assignment and to be reading about the opera. Um, and it also made me think what you had to say, Stuart, it is very human. These are real people. We present them in a very formal um, context, uh, a very hopefully visually exciting way, but we're responding to the emotion in the music. It's incredible music. It just rouses emotion. I was listening to the dance today at the orchestra rehearsal, and I was so moved. Mm. Um, it, it, it makes you feel things a little bit more vividly, I feel like. And I'm also, I, I think too, of this, this idea from Shakespeare that if we're performing a play or doing an opera, we're holding a mirror up to see ourselves reflected. With a piece like Salome, yes, we're doing that. You, just, you might not like looking at what you see. You might not like mm. what you see, um, but it's, it's still pretty valid. From the guys who were actually singing a couple of these roles, uh, how, did, how did these statements uh, strike you? Well, I, I have to say, I've done, I don't know, Greer and I have done this opera a lot. Uh, we've done some very strange productions of this <laughs> opera. Um, this is incredibly tame compared to the ones, and I, and I am loving this production, absolutely loving it. Uh, but I just think critics are going to be critics, <laughs> and it doesn't matter when it is. It could be any time, and they're going to, they criticize to criticize. Mm -hmm. It's one person's opinion. I, I don't read them anymore. <laughs> did you see your review? And I say, no, I didn't yeah. see it. And they say, oh, you have to read it. I, somebody did that to me recently. I was doing a Pagliacci, and they said, you've got to read the review. It's fantastic. <laughs> and I said, all right, let me see the review. And I said, oh, and I read the review, and it's a great review for the opera. 
but the uh, reviewer had left my name out. Of, and I was, oh. I was singing Canio and he left my name out of the review. And I nice, thought, but nice. why did you tell me it was a great review? Well, it was a good review for the opera. I mean, you know, so. <laughs> so, you know, reviewers are always going to be reviewers and, and critics. I mean, critics are, it's the, uh, one person's opinion. But yeah. I, I, maybe it was shocking back in 19, you know. You know in well, I find it strange that, the, that somebody, somebody of this caliber, supposedly, because he's got a big name in, in uh, musical Criticism. There you are. That's the. I can tell um, you a lot of big names of a lot of big critics. Yeah, and but uh, um, um, th that he would be so dismissive of what I think is is really a, a knock on the door of mm -hmm. of, of uh, operatic style in the twentieth century. I, I think it's yeah. some of the most intense music I have. It really is. I mean, ever, I mean, it, it looks forward I mean, to Wozzeck. Yeah. You know, it's not all that far no. removed. It's it's an incredible score, yeah. incredible. Greer, do you have any uh, reaction? Well, I, I think if I would have the chance to meet him, my first question would be, who hurt you? <laughs> uh, and uh, <laughs> because obviously he's, he's, his his uh, opinion of life in general it seems to be shaded by some sort of unfortunate event in his life. Uh, that that's the only thing that I can surmise about him because it's just you cannot deny the genius of this work, and um, it's, it's amazing. And uh, Alan mentioned that, that we've been involved in some pretty strange productions, and the, the thing that always uh, I have to uh, laugh at when, when I'm in the middle of a strange production of Salome is that they're trying to make a shocking opera even more shocking, but in doing so, they completely remove the shock effect of yeah. the it opera. It doesn't. And it doesn't. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't but work. Uh, no, this this poor gentleman. I, I I hope he found some joy in his life before he. <laughs> well, he I met I his think end. perhaps his stepfather made him dance for him one yeah. night. Yeah. Might have been uh, difficult. Oh, did I say that? Strauss. Um, Strauss saw the play. Yeah. By Oscar Wilde in 1902 at the Kleines Theater. Uh, the production was by Max Reinhardt, so it must have been amazing. This was one of Reinhardt's very first uh, um, directing gigs in, in, um, in Berlin. And it was in a very small theater. I'm sure it had a lot of impact. What do you think it was about the play that attracted Strauss in the first place? Well, I, I, I'll I'll go at that. Um, I think uh, if you look at the time period, the the um, Berlin was bursting, Vienna was bursting, and it was a time where people were challenging the the status quo, um, especially in Europe, uh, in not Paris, so much here. Paris during that time. And and yes, and also Paris. Um, and so you know you had impressionism uh, bursting forth, and and I think it just was it, it was this this very um, fresh view of, of certain things and also at the same time sort of questioning what we what we call you know what we what we consider you know a, a Bible story um, uh, while at one point very briefly uh, flirted with being a priest um, and that was that was I'm I mean that was gone very quickly, <laughs> but there, but um, but there was still uh, there was still a, a certain amount of respect that he he carried with him through that uh, after that, um, and in and in sort of posing these questions and imposing imposing uh, uh, points of view about sexuality about I mean you know at this, not not long before this there was the fawn you know which was which was. Uh, uh, also, this this uh, cause celeb, so you had you had a time where people were pushing the limits, and I think that's what that's what spoke to Strauss and musicians at the time was was looking for something beyond what they learned, beyond you know going beyond and 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 finding a new language. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Maestro, the score of this piece seems to me just listening to it. On a, on a surface level, to be very mm. complex. Um, can you address that? Is it, it the, the many layers of uh, instrumental sound and color, as well as light motifs? That's a very thickly uh, palleted piece. It seems to me. Oh it's, yes, indeed, it is. Um, 
difficult to specify exactly what constitutes a thick score. Just all you could say is that a lot of instruments are playing at the same time, all doing different things. Uh, it's very elaborate, very colorful, and it's one of those operas rather like um, Mozart's Domino, and indeed Tibbet's Midsummer Marriage, that are literally bursting at the seams. Is the only way I can describe it. It was mm. a musical invention. Uh, all, all set out with the singers and this, this enormous orchestra, which I'm afraid we have to cut down a little bit, but I don't think we lose any of the colour at all. I mean, people were, were incredibly... Uh, uh, what's, that, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, so trouble is with old age, I keep forgetting the words I want. Um, <laughs> they were very sort of generous with the amount of, of, of uh, performers they expected to use. Strauss, in this piece, if you add up his original uh, requirements, there are 106 players. Mm. Now, that's, there are not many pits that I can think of that can accommodate 106 players. Uh, it was first formed in Dresden, so I assumed that that was possible. But he very quickly found he had to uh, make do with somewhat less than his exorbitant demand of strings. Uh, we don't lose a lot from that, really, and I think it's, uh, we've stuffed the pit here absolutely full. You can't get another mouse in. Mm. <coughs> <coughs> and, and we play away, and it's, it's very exciting, indeed. Wonderfully exciting. I just want to re re um, refer, I suppose, that which Kerman seemed to think was a, not a terribly good idea. This wonderful chord at the end, the big motive, the big motive that Zalami has. And there's a chord there that is deliberately dissonant, which, which made up of two tonalities. And it actually sends you, it shakes your bones. Oh, yes. Yeah. You know, it's an absolute bone shaker of a, of a sound. And it does that to you, it shoots through electricity. And it's quite the most, one of the most dramatic moments I can think of. Somebody else. <laughs> that's, that's lovely. Um, <laughs> I've been talking about the orchestra. Lisa, let's bring you into this because it must be quite a challenge to sing over 106 musicians. <laughs> <laughs> what is that like, just physically, just from the standpoint of being one person standing on a stage? I only have sound. 80 this time, so that's okay. <laughs> Maybe I'll have a better chance. Uh, yeah, it is a, quite a physical challenge, and one of the reasons why this is such a daunting role for so many singers, uh, so many sopranos and baritones and tenors, because mm -hmm. the size of the orchestra is quite large. Um, but uh, let's see, what can I say about that? <clears throat> it's like jumping off the high dive, you just sort of hope that you land in the middle of the water. And with the help of a brilliant conductor, which we do have, um, there's a partnership in keeping the balances together. So not everyone is playing at their heartfelt loudest all of the time, all night, um, because frankly, it would kill us all, including the pit. It would kill me and um, probably the conductor as well. Mm. Um, is it is it f more thrilling or is it a little daunting and scary? No, it's absolutely thrilling. It's absolutely thrilling. Mm. It's the best thing ever. To have that wall of sound and, and get to catapult my voice over it, through it, around it somehow. Yeah, it's great. Mm. It's fantastic. Now, this production um, emanated really from, from you, Sean. Uh, it, it was built, I guess, originally for uh, Opera Theatre St. Louis. Yes. And you and the designer, Bruno, you had the concept and yeah. you worked with a designer whose name was, excuse Bruno me. Bruno Schwengel to create it. Tell us a, a, yeah. a little bit about uh, the production. Uh, Bruno Schwengel has, has done the sets and costumes for this production. And um, when we were given the assignment, we got together and we started talking and dreaming. But we decided very early on we were not going to do a biblical, traditional kind of a setting. And because I was reading this book by Alice Ro Alex Ross, I was thinking a lot about the time when the opera premiered, 1905, what was going on in the world, the art world. And um, I looked at lots of paintings by Gustav Klimt and Egon Schiele, and I thought about the modern dancing, iconoclastic, fierce women who were making dances then, Isadora Duncan, Ruth St. Dennis, Loie Fuller. So I got very turned on by what was going on in the art world in 1905, 
and uh, uh, we thought for a while, we'd, we'd set it in 1905, but we sort of opened it up to make it a little bit more sort of accessible and universal and, and gave it what we've called a non-specific modern setting. There were certainly biblical references and touches, um, but it's a very formal kind of a piece. In addition to the art of the period, I looked at a lot of religious art. There's an incredible amount of paintings of Salome. In mm. fact, Gustav Klimt made one five years after the premiere of the opera, which we were talking about. And um, very beautiful, romanticized, lush paintings. Sometimes she's naked, all the time she's with the head, you know. And I was looking at these paintings, and I have a thing for religious art. I'm kind of a collapsed Catholic, but <laughs> I went to parochial school, but I've, I've, I stuck, I love that kind, that brand of art. And I have a big religious kitsch art collection. So I was thinking about paintings in frames, golden frames, or a religious icon, or these beautiful paintings of Salome, and I thought, let's, let's make picture of Salome. Let's put the piece in a gold frame as if we're looking at beautiful paintings and pictures. Um, and this idea about composition, uh, perspective in painting. One of the devices I use is Yohanahan is cuffed on his left wrist and ankle with thick black ropes. He's superhuman and powerful and two soldiers hold him. And it makes a wonderful kind of visual effect uh, with this kind of almost sort of the way, uh, not to compare myself to the master, but the way a Da Vinci painting has that wonderful sense of, of perspective and, and horizon and all. So, um, you know, I come to opera directing from concert dance. I'm a modern dance choreographer, where I'm a music-driven guy, I'm responding to music, but I'm not telling stories, I'm not imitating scenes from life. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned with movement invention, musical visualization, how do I get the audience to see the music, hear it differently uh, by scribbling in space. So composition is very important to me and it, the, the production is a series of pictures. We're moving through it, but hopefully it tickles the eye and, and your imagination in the way that, that the music can and rouse emotion. And with this kind of formality, this, this kind of... Um, direct, heightened kind of physicality and pedestrianism. I, I hope you get a vivid kind of telling of the story. The, that, uh, the opera's packed into 90 minutes. There's no intermission. It happens in real time, which is unusual in opera. Mm. It happens over the course of this evening at a party that Herod and Herodias are throwing. In our version, it's a party for Salome, but they've invited none of her friends. It's, <laughs> it's all the politicians and, and people they need favors from. <laughs> Um, it's like growing up in the White House, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, this is your birthday party, but we're inviting the Supreme Court justices and the, yeah, yeah. yeah, right. So the fact that it unfolds in real time, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end, and it's that hour and a half and that evening appeal to me as a choreographer, because when I make dances, it's not about before or in the future. It's a real time kind of a thing. So, um, yeah, I wanted to give it a very vivid, heightened kind of sharp look with the nod to art history and, and religious art. That sounds exciting. I haven't, I've just seen still photos of, of the production, uh, looking very much forward to actually experiencing it in the theater. It sounds like, well, it sounds like fun, number one. Yeah. <laughs> but then with those references, it should be great. Fun uh, and scary, I hope. Scary at the same time. Yeah. You know, yeah, as we were talking, um, it dawned on me last night we had a community conversation with, um, uh, uh, John Marchari, who is the curator of Euro European art at the San Diego Art Museum, and as and we talked about images of Salome through history, uh, and right from the Renaissance on up to the time of of Klimt. Um, but I discovered, it's nothing new, but a, a film that was made in 1923, the Nazimova, the sets and costumes designed by Rambova. Which was not her name. She was a Hudnut um, uh, heiress. <coughs> Hudnut was the. Didn't they make uh, cosmetics or something? Um, uh, and she she patterned them after the Aubrey Beardsley drawings in the the first edition of the play of Oscar Wilde. But what's interesting is at the end of the show, she goes to get the head. You see the platter. And, she, and you see her look at it, you never see the head. 
And even when she puts the platter down on the ground, she tilts it towards her so that we in the audience don't see it. And then she takes her <coughs> cape and pulls it over herself and the head. And you see a little bit of squirming underneath it. So you don't have a clue what's going on <laughs> underneath, underneath that, that cope or that cape. And that's creepier than anything I've ever seen on the opera stage. But a question maybe generally, but I think specifically to you, uh, uh, Sean, what is it about the difference between doing it on stage and having a real 3D head, not made of marzipan, but <laughs> made by our wonderful uh, prop property developers and makers, artisans, um, uh, and then on film being shy about showing it, but, but, but solving, it, solving that reveal in a different way. Yeah, we actually have Greer's head, believe it or not, <laughs> and it's very disturbing because you look at it and it's Greer. It, yeah. um, we've been rehearsing with the head of a Canadian singer who I know, his name is Greg Dahl, and that's strange to me to see Greg's head being dragged around. <laughs> but it is very disturbing. But this is live theater, and uh, you get to see everything. Um, and I think the difference between what they would do with a film where you're in close, it's a subtler kind of acting, it's, it's different angles you're seeing. You know, uh, we're lucky that we have Lee's because she's such a compelling actress and is always thinking and making choices and, um, and playing in a way. There's a kind of rigor and intensity and focus and kind of an honesty in, in what she's doing. And I feel she's been a great collaborator because I say it the, on the first day, we're not starting from scratch, everybody in the cast, but we are in a sense starting over because uh, you know I come from the school of the dance is never done. You know, if you want to finish a piece of art, you make a pot or a painting and you hang it on the wall, you publish a novel. And, but when it's live theater, how do you speak an old language in a new way with a different accent every time you do it? Mm. So the, there's a very difficult scene where Salome is with that severed head. It's a very long time. I will tell you that it's a mini marathon. Um, and Lise is an incredibly focused, technical, assured singer who can hunker down and just dig in and deliver it. But to answer your question, it's, it's the collaboration with the actor who's inside in the middle of it, and then us, we're outside of it, trying to tell the story again vividly. And uh, we take some risks, um, and it's not to shock or titillate, but it is just to show this strange girl. Mm. You know, uh, we love Salome. We've, there's an expression now you hear in pop culture, we're all victims of victims. Salome isn't a bad seed, at least not for me. She, you know, is a victim of her circumstances. Spoiled girl sent off to school. She is learning about the power of her body as a 16-year-old young woman. She's always been fascinated with her power as a princess. Uh, there's lots of behavior in the show. We bow and we kneel to her. She's the princess. But all of a sudden, she has breasts and an ass and a vagina. And what do they do to Naraboth, the soldier who's smitten? He's the only one who really loves anyone in the piece. And her stepfather. Herod is not her father. Herod and Herodias had her real father murdered. So it's a stepfather, stepdaughter relationship. But I, I'll just say that the wheels are always turning. There's always different shadings and colorings. And um, I'm very grateful to have you know, a collaborator who's an incredible singer, obviously, but also a fine actor. Well, Lise, let's go, let's go with that. We had an interesting conversation in, in the podcast last week about uh, the duet with uh, Yokana An and how she acts like a teenager. Would you describe that, that duet um, for the audience? I think that's just a fascinating moment in the piece that, that tells us so much about her. Well, she, uh, she, she hears his voice from the cistern first, and it's such a compelling sound. She's never heard anything like that. She wants to know who this guy is. And uh, the, she learns from the soldiers that it's this guy who is the prophet, and everyone's terrified of him. That's why he's locked up in the cistern. 
and he has this beautiful voice that's riveting, which it truly is. Mm -hmm. And um, <coughs> then she finagles a way to get him out of the cistern and uh, without giving too much of everything away. Um, there he is in all of his white skin and this dark hair and this beautiful mouth. And she's, she's so accustomed to getting everything that she asks for that when he rejects her requests so that for her to touch his body, touch his skin, have his skin, um, she says, well, I don't want your skin anyway. Just mm -hmm. in a typical classic teenager -y moment of, well, I didn't want that car anyway, Dad. It's a stupid car. And so she says, I don't want your body anyway. I want your hair. And then he says, you can't have my hair. And she said, well, I didn't want your hair anyway. I want your mouth. And then he said, absolutely not. And it, it shoves her over the edge because she certainly never heard no three times in a row. Mm. Um, and again, just to extrapolate a little bit on the background in the sense that I do, I feel a great amount of empathy for the character. You didn't ask me this, but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> um, I feel a great amount of empathy for the character um, because she doesn't know that she's demented. She doesn't know that she's deluded. She doesn't know that she's spoiled. She doesn't know she's grown up in a household that is truly off mentally in lots of ways. She probably knows that her father was killed by her mother and stepfather, um, but maybe she thinks that that's just the way of the world. So it's always interesting to approach these characters not from a position of demonizing them and then trying to find the redeeming qualities, but from a position of them not knowing they're wrong. It's much more interesting. Mm. Um, Alan and Greer, it's, it's, it's interesting that the two of you are paired down here at the, at the end of the table because <laughs> I want to essentially ask you two sides of the same question. Um, it, it seems to, to my ear that Yokanaan or John the Baptist's uh, musical language is essentially very lyrical um, and, and, and very heroic at, at certain points. And Alan, uh, as <laughs> Herod, <the> opposite. <laughs> your music sounds exactly the opposite from that. And in fact, there are moments, uh, I think particularly of the moment where Herodias takes his death ring off mm -hmm. of his finger and then there is this cacophony in the orchestra, and things are just completely off kilter, and we don't know where we are harmonically. But interestingly enough, he does have, there are moments where in his little sanity, which is very few moments, um, that Herod has some beautiful lyrical moments. Well, that's what I want to ask both so of you. So he does, I mean, and his, all of a sudden, he'll, he'll come out of his craziness for mm -hmm. a minute, a few minutes at a time, and he has this, especially when it comes to Zalame, he... He's, he's just fascinated with her right now, and he's wanting her, and he can't take his eyes off her, and he's trying to do everything he can, and there are moments that he's singing, trying to get her, she says, I'll give you this, and I'll give you, I have this great wine. Mm -hmm. and, the, and those are the lyrical lines that I sing to her. How about some fruit? I have a wonderful piece of fruit for mm -hmm. you. And, it's, and those, but it's the moments where he he has a screw loose, what, what, uh, more than one, mm. and he he sees black birds flying around his head, you know. And it, he'll be talking to somebody. It's almost like he's speaking in tongues because he'll be talking normally. He's like, what was that? Or it, it's it's really cold. No, it's hot. No, it's cold. No, it's hot. <laughs> no, he, he just and then he'll go back. So what would you like? Is there mm. something I can get you? Mm. I mean, so it, which is the reason I love, I absolutely love the role of Herod. It's one of my favorite roles to do because, because of this unsteadiness in his brain and, and being able to do this and go like that all the time. And well, the I love that you. So great. I love that you said that you, you you also enjoy approaching the role lyrically. Yes. Because yes. there there are a number of singers out there who simply don't. I mean, they just mm. portray him as absolutely bonkers and yeah. crazy, and that the music is crazy, and they just approach it that way. Yeah. And it is often barked. Yeah. But um, you sing it. I sing it, which is wonderful, and it's very refreshing to hear Thanks. from as crazy a character as Herod is. He still has to keep that craziness. Though. Yeah. 
Yeah. Greer, what about uh, Yokana on? Uh, do you find that you're speaking an almost totally different musical language than the people that surround you in this piece? Um, I, I, it, 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 it can sound that way, but I mean, I find there is a relation to in in the whole piece uh, with it. It's he is he is um, uh, I I am I take him as the symbol of of uh, normal for you know it's it's how we gauge how crazy everyone else is, and, and Strauss is brilliant to give us that musical language um, for Johanna on that it's that his is is. Um, in most cases, is this very, very heroic and um, forthright music in the re and in the piece and the rest of the people? He composes this very, very uh, um, uh, frenetically filled uh, orchestration for the rest of the characters, so that you do have a you do have a gauge of you know that this isn't completely everyone is crazy, you know, but in a sense that 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 um, the Baptist is is very single-minded about about his purpose and about w what uh, what people should be doing and how they should live so in essence he's also a member of of That's of true. this of this family of humans that are very single-minded about what they want and and uh, but his is his ends up in the normal range <laughs> whereas the rest of the, the rest of the, the cast are not you know it's a, it's a it's, very different role for you compared to the roles that you've sung for us. Yes. Where, where there's all yeah. villains, and now yeah. you get to be the good guy in, in, in a Lastly, sense. Lastly, the devil. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and now I'm on the other side of the fence. Um, it, it, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it, it's a wonderful role. It's a gift. Um, and I consider this piece a masterwork, and it's, and it's always an honor and a privilege to get to do it. Um, and to to give to give the character you know some humanness, not just what we what we've been taught about him, and and uh, uh, and, and bring bring him to a more human scale mm -hmm. um, in this piece, um, and not take away any of his 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 conviction, but he is he is a human, yeah. in, in essence. And, and the thing I love about being on the on the on the the uh, black robes is that I don't know if this was a consideration of yours but there is a candle there is a there's a saying be be a candle in the darkness mm -hmm. and in essence he is sort of the flame at the end of the wick mm -hmm. of this of these two of these of this black line mm -hmm. that's keeping him there mm -hmm. maestro um you are known as a, a specialist with the music of benjamin Britten. you've spent a lot of time in your career conducting those scores um this is the first time that you've conducted Zalome. Have you conducted other Strauss oh, scores? Yes. yes, I worked on a lot of Strauss operas actually in my time. I've done quite a lot of things other than Britain. <laughs> uh, don't, uh, don't forget, I won't reel you with a list. <laughs> uh, but was, I've, in, I've been going a long time. Oh, no, 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 I don't believe that. <laughs> no, I, I guess what I'm curious is, did, did, uh, did your conducting of Britain help prepare you in any way for the challenge of, of conducting Zalome? Or uh, uh, did, did you just take it in, in stride? Uh, I don't think there was And a how on earth did you learn it? I guess uh, well, I guess. Yes, <laughs> it's a, it took a lot of work. Um, the, I don't think there's a connection with these things. Britain actually was an admirer of Strauss, and you, those of us who know our Peter Grimes will recognize mm. that the, the offstage music in the third act is absolutely taken straight out of Rosencavalier. Mm -hmm. Uh, in almost to the, to the actual number of dances and the, and the shape of the dances. Uh, it's quite extraordinary. He did study that piece while he was in hospital, uh, having glandular fever or something. Uh, and um, he learned from it, certainly did. And Strauss was a great uh, technician. He was a wonderful technician. And things, unfortunately, he's, uh, he states categorically at one time that um, uh, because people tended to remonstrate with him because the orchestra was so large and it was, had a very, uh, tended to overwhelm the singers. And he said, there's nothing that overwhelms the singers in this piece uh, if the orchestra plays to the dynamic I have written. Mm. 
Uh, well, of course, that's absolute rubbish. <laughs> uh, it's not. It simply is not true at all. And one simply does have to make adjustments. I'm afraid we have to change these dynamics a little bit in order just to allow a little bit of a, a voice through. But one thing I do uh, beg of everybody is that, that you have to, if you're listening to singers in an opera house, everybody has a different capacity for hearing the words. Mm. No two people will give you the same thing. You can sit next to somebody where you've heard every word and they can say to you, I can't hear any words at all. I've actually seen this happen on so many occasions. So people vary in their capacity for this. So you can't really make a, 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 a categorical judgment and say anything is specifically too loud or not. But we'll try and make it possible for you to hear as much as is conceivably possible. I guess that's all one can do. Is indeed, <laughs> indeed. Is keep coaching and hoping that they won't follow what's written, but listen to <laughs> listen to your ears. Well, we we uh, we actually the, the orchestral musicians play what's in their part, and so if you get them to change a forte to a piano, that will happen. Mm. Um, Lise, I I can't let this conversation go without asking about the dance. We have to talk about the dance, and uh, I'm sure everybody has questions about the dance, but I'm going to only ask you one. Isn't it, it and it's a, it's a yes or no question, isn't it wonderful that Strauss doesn't demand that you sing while you dance? <laughs> <laughs> that you get a little time off from singing. I imagine if he had thought of it, he would have done it. <laughs> He's but, evil, truly evil. But tell us about the dance. How do you, how do you approach that? I mean, especially if, if you don't have a dance background. What, well, do, you, what it, do you do? How do you We talked about this a little bit before you and I, and... Um, it's always best if the dance is something organic from the production. In other words, if it's a direct relationship, it's a direct product of everything that's come before, of whatever backstory has been established with the production and the director and the musical staff. And so it's an organic transition. So it doesn't feel like it's tacked on. Yeah, I mean there was a set piece of some in sort. A, a certain tradition there was a time when singers, sopranos would show up to an opera production of Zalome and say, well I have my dance and regardless of whether it was appropriate to the production or not, that's the dance that happened. <laughs> it also was a tradition that someone else did the dance and Boy, do I understand that. <laughs> but all of that aside, this is truly a pinnacle experience for me, this production, because this dance is not only so inherently organic to the entire production, it's a fantastic dance. It's, um, it's not cheesy in any way, which so many dances of seven veils can be, because one presumes there are seven veils layered on the poor soprano, and throughout the process of the dance, all seven of these veils get removed, and then down at the end, you're wondering how big that last veil is going to be. <laughs> and, um, and everybody's counting. And everyone's counting. Yeah. They're like, was that five or was that four? I can't remember. And how in the buff is she going to be at the end, which is always a question, which I won't spoil the ending for and, you and, now. And notice I didn't ask. I know. Oh, I Thank appreciate you. that. Okay, good. <laughs> um, but this experience is uh, so remarkable because we have Sean, because Sean comes from such a wealth of information of dance, music, punctuation with a body, and characterization. And he's able to provide a framework for Zalame to do a dance. That, and then it just keeps growing and growing and growing, and we keep finding more to put inside this framework so that these relationships between Zalame and Herod, Zalame and Herodias, even Zalame and John the Baptist become, it just gets richer and richer and richer. Mm. And it's, I think it's a beautiful dance. Mm. I hope I can do it well, but it it's is, a beautiful, it beautiful dance. Yes. So I hope you all like it. We will, we will. Let's take some questions from the, uh, from the audience. We've told you everything that you need to know about <laughs> Salome. You have no questions. I'm sure if somebody. Last night, last night you mentioned about the seven veils and that it doesn't have any biblical 
origin to it. And where did you find any more information about the origin? Of it? No, I didn't, but that's a good question perhaps for Sean. Um, what is the origin of the Dance of the Seven Veils specifically? I know it's tradition because it's certainly not in the Bible no, story. Do you know I, where it comes from? I don't, and I wasn't so interested in it because I, I knew I wanted to do something very theatrical, and um, I wanted to do Salome's party piece. You know, this uh, you know, a kid gets up and sings a song or does a dance at a party, and sort of in our fantasy and, and Salome's backstory, we talk about we've talked about if she were was a contemporary kid today, she'd be in her bedroom lip syncing to Beyonce records, mm. and. Um, you know, singing them with the TV or whatever. Um, we have seven different pieces of fabric which relate uh, to these icons of modern dance. There's a, the first section is, is a riff on Ruth St. Dennis's Sari dance. Ruth St. Dennis at this time was going to Asia and, and bringing back what was then called Orientalism. And uh, she would go there and watch the dances of different places and then appropriate or steal or take them back. So there's a sorry dance. Loey Fuller was an American dancer and choreographer working in Paris with voluminous pieces of fabric. She was actually uh, innovative in terms of lighting design. She was the first person to use colored light. She'd get colored bits of glass and put it in front of a gas lamp or light or something to throw color on the fabric. Um, Doris Humphrey is famous for a dance called Soaring, where she uses a piece of silk that goes up and down. Um, so the idea was that Salome would have been getting dance lessons from the best dance teachers available mm -hmm. uh, in Europe at the time. So um, it's seven different bits of fabric and, um, yeah, sort of riffing on these American, uh, not American, but these uh, iconic American, uh, yeah, they are, they are American, iconic American women who in the day were revolutionary. Isadora Duncan running around in bare feet in a Grecian tunic with, tunic with no bra was freaking people out at parties, you know, <laughs> in Europe then. So I thought, you know, Salome is that kind of woman. It must be a challenge to sing and act and, and direct a one act opera that builds in suspense and emotion from the beginning to the end. How do you handle that in your uh, various uh, uh, skills? Because it certainly must be a temptation to go a little bit too much at the beginning or in the middle and then not have much left, so. It's, it points to me. Well, it's <laughs> especially, it, it's funny you ask us, uh, I come out with gangbusters. One of my entrance is very big when I come out. And it is very dangerous, you're absolutely right. It has to stay, it has to have levels. And it has to, yes, he comes out, he has this big thing, where, but it has to come, he's gotta have these different levels of coming in and out of it. Otherwise it's all just boom, 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 blah, the whole time, and it doesn't work. So you are absolutely correct, and, that's, and that, it is very difficult to do that. And I always, I'm always saying to Sean, okay, am I doing too much? Tell me, <laughs> just tell me now. I can take it back. <laughs> take it back because it's you especially for the role of Herod he's so out there you want to just be out there all the time and and it's I'm always tone, trying okay tone it down tone especially in what I call my jewel song uh, I have an art a little ariet which I'm talking about all these jewels and if I sang the whole thing just blasting it loud first of all I couldn't get through it if I did that but it's it's finding the colors in that and it's and, I, and I'm running around the stage like a maniac at the same time so but it is, it is very difficult, and it's, it's about different colors and different moments and not letting it all be big all the time. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I, I think that's part of it is the, the genius of Strauss is that he's, he, he leads you through it as well with how he's written it. And, and if you do um, a lot of the things that he suggests and, and, and bring the colors forward that, that about, about the text that you're speaking, then it sort of helps, mm -hmm. it helps you Go, go through the scene and build it correctly. I, like, I talk a lot about calibration. How are you calibrating that? It's sort of an interesting approach. I will tell you that um, the original production was in a 800 seat tiny theater with a thrust stage, which means the stage comes into the audience and there's audience on three sides. Very small orchestra pit, which meant the cistern couldn't go down. So I had a lot of challenges. Uh, because it's a thrust stage, there's no curtain to go out. 
uh, Strauss has not written an overture. The music starts, Narabov takes a breath, and we have liftoff. So one of the ways I solve that is we do what you'd call a dumb show or a pre-show, where there's, it's exposition. I'm basically setting the scene for you. The soldiers come on, the slaves, it's the end of the party. Naraboth comes out, he's looking at Salome through a door or into a window. So 10 minutes before the downbeat, we're setting it up. Um, and I always think of it a little bit like we're in the lounge at the airport and soon we'll be getting on the plane and then the plane will be on the runway and then the plane will take off. So it is, it's a, it's a fine art of calibration and pacing um, because as a director, I never want the audience to get ahead of me, right? I don't want you to get there before I do. And uh, we sort of know the story, we know it's coming. So it's a, it's a, it's a da fine dance, not to make a joke, but it's a fine dance of calibration. Um, yeah. One more quick question. Uh, Sean, thanks for answering the question I'm just about to ask. Uh, I'm acquainted with the Opera Theater of St. Louis and the intimacy of the almost uh, theater in the round. <laughs> and I appreciated what you said earlier about setting up the gold frames around the uh, artwork. But how and what are you doing so that this audience here in a 3,000 seat massive auditorium can avoid thinking about the proscenium and focus on what you're really doing uh, in single frames of, uh, of art, as it were, that moving art? Yes. Um, uh the set has basically doubled in size, believe it or not. It's much wider and deeper. And uh, for uh, it's been in Montreal and San Francisco for these large proscenium houses. Um, I had to do a little bit more visual storytelling with the set. In St. Louis, we have what you call VOMs, which vomitoriums where the performers can come up under the audience, make an entrance onto the stage. So Vom right was always into the palace for me, and Vom left was where the slaves or the soldiers went to sleep or eat. Um, so I had to go back to the designer and say, I need some visual information to help the audience. And he's designed this great sort of architectural tube that is coming in from stage right where the palace would be. We're sort of outside in a backyard and just some simple slabs of what looked like concrete on stage left where the, the soldiers and slaves live or, or would go. I'm also aided by the fact that we have a beautiful, big, round, white circle, a moon. The moon is very important in the piece. So we literally place the moon, a big full moon, over the audience's head, but it's also on stage. So um, a big part of my job is telling the audience's eye where to go, where to look. And sometimes I need you to look at a couple of places at once. And um, I'll be honest with you, I've been criticized for this, coming with such a compositional choreographic approach using space in an architectural way. Um, but I think it's what I can do best and, uh, you know, tell you where to look. I, you know, it's, it's an it's a opera and it's a theater, but I do think filmically, where is the camera and how close up do you want to be and how far back? Um, and it's, it's been a lesson for somebody who doesn't necessarily tell stories with their dance making. It's been a, a, a real tough lesson, but a satisfying one. This has been a great conversation. Thank you so much all for Thank being you. here. We look forward to Salome opening next week. Thank you.